with us on Con Air. In the U.S., more than a million people live behind bars. And every year, more than 150,000 of them take flight on an exclusive airline where all the passengers are criminals and all the flight attendants are U.S. Marshals. Please join us as we go behind closed doors of the maximum security cell block in the sky, better known as Con Air. It's officially known as JPATS, the Justice Prisoner and Alien Transportation System. Murderers, rapists, and drug dealers are some of the inmates on the passenger list, and it's up to the U.S. Marshals Service to move them safely and securely. This is a very dangerous job. JPATS really handles the worst of the worst. We usually think of prisoners as being locked up in one place and staying that way, but they're not. On any given day, more than 1,000 prisoners are on the move, being transported around the country for court dates, prison transfers, and medical treatment. In order to do this story, there were certain ground rules. We can't show the prisoners' faces or talk with them on camera. Even behind prison walls, violence is a constant threat. But authorities know they are most vulnerable when the inmates are in transit. You don't want them out of, outside the, the cell block uh, any longer than you have to. Years in law enforcement have taught many who transfer prisoners to expect the worst from these hardened criminals. Seems like life doesn't mean anything to them. They're gonna take whatever chances and they really don't care about the consequences. If you let your guard down, uh, it may be your last day in law enforcement. We try to train people to guard against that. I went behind closed doors of the U.S. Marshal Service to discover how they transport some of the world's most dangerous criminals. I also wanted to find out firsthand what it's like to fly on Con Air, not as a guest, but as a prisoner, something no other journalist has ever done. Kent Pekarik is in charge of JPATS and has worked in the Marshal Service for 30 years. He described the kind of inmates that would be on my flight. There's gang members, bank robbers, uh, narcotic violators. So we have just about everybody. Part of the Department of Justice, the U.S. Marshal Service has been moving prisoners for more than 200 years. And that experience has translated into an impressive safety record. We've moved over 1.5 million prisoners over the last 17 years using U.S. Marshal JPATS aircraft. And this is without a major incident. We don't accomplish that by being lucky. They do it with precision, planning, and airtight security, which starts in their Oklahoma City Flight Operations Center. Like a commercial airline, they have their own fleet of jets including 727s, DC-9s, and two MD-80s. But they also have smaller planes used for special missions. Private jets like this one normally cater to CEOs and celebrities, but here in Oklahoma City, they are reserved for the country's most notorious and dangerous criminals. Extreme measures are taken to ensure their safety and ours. Mob boss John Gotti, Timothy McVeigh, Unabomber Ted Kaczynski, and accused 9-11 terrorist Zacharias Musawi have all been on board these multi-million dollar jets. When you deal with terrorists, you're dealing with, with uh, individuals that have very unpredictable behavior, that uh, involve themselves in extremely violent crimes, that have a great network uh, on the outside that we need to consider in terms of trying to move them both in the air and on the ground. Nothing is left a chance with these high-risk inmates. To me, it looked like something straight out of a movie. The prisoners' faces are covered so they can't bite or spit and special mesh gloves cover their handcuffs to restrict their movement. On board, there is at least one security officer for each prisoner. It's effective, but costly. When we moved uh, Timothy McVeigh from Oklahoma City to Denver, 
um, uh, it cost a approximately a little over $11,000 for that movement. While special prisoners are transported on small planes, the majority of inmates fly on large jets with scheduled routes to more than 40 cities. Larger stops like Atlanta and Chicago are scheduled every week. Smaller ones like Albuquerque and Tampa every two weeks. This is the schedule for tomorrow and we also have a death row inmate scheduled on there. Like a busy travel agency, this office books more than a thousand seats a day. But these reservations come with an extensive background check of every inmate on board. Uh, we look at the criminal history, the security risks, the health issues, the safety issues. Uh, by the time that person's scheduled, we have a pretty good idea of what we're dealing with. On these flights, information is on a need-to-know basis, and the inmates don't need to know. We don't typically tell them when they're going to be moved and where they're going to be moved. In a lot of senses, it's a big guessing game, and uh, we purposely make it a guessing game. If the prisoners don't know the itinerary, they can't organize an ambush or orchestrate an escape. Come on, guys, in the cell. Although few inmates ever try, they still have to assume every prisoner is an escape risk. They treat all of them as if they are maximum security, regardless of the crime. I want to stress, you know, even though we know the person who's the serial killer, the murderer, the killer, you know, don't drop your guard on this person who's doing two years for credit card fraud or one year for tax evasion. Uh, this person may not think that they can do that one year and they're going to do everything in their power to escape. I'd soon have a chance to experience Con Air for myself on board a flight originating in Kansas City. You're going to be getting on what I consider to be one of the safest aircraft and the safest operations that will be in the air this afternoon. I know that last night the airplane was under 24-hour surveillance. No one put anything on the airplane. I know this morning that it was searched. I know the backgrounds of everybody that we're moving this afternoon. I know where they're seated. I know why they're being moved. There's absolutely nothing about that flight that I don't know about. I'll be accompanied on my flight by Deputy Marshal Larry Yo. He's been transporting prisoners since 1987. Sometimes we have to wrestle with some of them, we have to fight them. We have some of them like to spit on us, try to bite us. Does it take just one to try to attack to create chaos? Yes, ma'am. Sometimes you'll have one, he'll set off a whole group of people. Priority number one, none of them get to the cockpit. They're not going to take over a plane. They are fully restrained. A problem arises, and we're going to take care of it right then. When we come back, I'll join the prisoners aboard Conair Flight 113. Every day, Conair, or JPATS as it's officially known, moves more than a thousand prisoners. Today, I'll be traveling with them. My journey begins in a holding cell in downtown Kansas City. London, top of the area. Dressed in jailhouse orange, I will go through the same security process as a real inmate, with one key difference. I will be allowed to ask the officers questions along the way, but I can't talk with the prisoners on camera or show their faces. The moment I stepped outside of the cell, I was put in restraints by detention officer Siobhan Gallo. Handcuffs were just the beginning. What's this thing? That is uh, to limit your mobility. These are the leg irons. These are to limit you from running. There we go. The handcuffs, waist chain, and leg irons really restricted my movement. I certainly couldn't run. In fact, I had trouble even walking. This is the first time they've allowed a journalist to go behind closed doors aboard a JPATS flight to experience Con Air through the eyes of a prisoner. Like the inmates, I was kept shackled at all times. Marshals transported me by car, but they also use vans or buses depending on the number of prisoners. I can't swing your feet. We call it hooking and hauling. So we hook them up in their restraints and we haul them over to wherever the JPATS flight is coming into. Marshal Brad English was armed and at the wheel. Officer Gallo was unarmed, sitting next to me. 
This is our most vulnerable moment. So we have to be aware. Every vehicle we pass, we look at it. We're looking for at the faces. Might be something that we don't see, especially when we come to a stop. Why did you become a U.S. Marshal? Ever since I was little, I remember watching Starsky and Hutch and all the, every cop show imaginable and just wanting to catch the bad guy. That's what we do, that's what we want to do, to make, and try to make the world and our community a little better for everyone else. While I was on my way to the Kansas City airport, buses carrying prisoners were already in place, waiting for the unmarked JPAT 727. The planes land at the same airports we use for commercial flights, but in areas far away from the public. We go to the most remote and most secure area also. And we want to make sure that there's not a place for, for snipers or a place for an ambush or if somebody were to uh, have a van uh, with people in the van who could rush the airplane. Like clockwork, marshals armed with shotguns surrounded the jet. The buses pulled up and the transfer began. Their goal? To get nearly 100 prisoners off the plane, put 100 more on and get off the ground as quickly as possible. It's a well choreographed routine that happens four to five times every day. As my car pulled onto the tarmac, I couldn't help feeling a little frightened. The prisoners on my flight are in for everything from murder to bank robbery. Regardless of their crime, each and every one is considered dangerous and they're treated that way. The prisoners are searched when they come out of the institution and then they're searched again before they get on the airplane then when they get to that destination, they're searched again before they get into the next destination. They may be searched three or four times within one hour. They're looking for improvised weapons. I watched as officers checked the prisoners' clothes, hair, and even their mouths. Then it was my turn. Clearly these inmates are used to the endless searches, but for me, it was disconcerting. Ordinary airport security is strict, but it can't compare to this. Next, it was time to board the plane. I was put on last. Three keys. That was Joan needed to come behind that wall where all that stabbing and that killing going on. <laughs> they doing all that killing that behind that wall. Well, we just left from Leavenworth. And they think, they think it's gonna be a cake, y'all. It was a long walk. I couldn't make out everything the prisoners were yelling, but I understood enough to feel uneasy and a little intimidated. To make matters worse, the restraints made everything difficult. Simply fastening my seatbelt was a challenge. Looking around, the interior looked deceptively ordinary. There were no bars on the windows or jail cells on the plane. But as I expected, there were a few big differences from commercial flights. There were no movies, no magazines, no blankets or pillows, and no flight attendants. And there was no pre-flight announcement as Justice 113 took off for Oklahoma City. I'd been on hundreds of flights, but none like this. Like all female prisoners, I was seated away from the men in the front of the plane. Even with all the marshals on board, Officer Brooks Howard feared for my safety. I've got some guys on here uh, that are multiple murderers and things of that nature. And when you have someone that has nothing to lose or is incarcerated or sentenced to death, which I've transported many times, um, it'd be just kind of a feather in their hat to you walk by and, and them get a hold of you and, and assault you. And uh, we took the strictest precautions today so that would not happen. We've never had anybody escape, as I understand it. No, ma'am. We've never had anybody escape from uh, Marsh Service Airlift. Throughout the flight, I noticed that the officers never take their eyes off the prisoners. They're constantly scanning the aisles. Tray tables and sharp objects have also been removed from the plane. You really have to be careful because they can make a weapon out of just about anything. Yes, yeah, a matter of fact, we've had them, uh, I don't know if I want to go into the things that they've taken off the plane, but they fashioned um, foot-long knives off of things in the airplane. It's pretty, uh, with their teeth, you know, biting it down and making making things uh, bend and fold to, to form knives and shanks and things of that nature. So yes, you have to be aware of what, what they're doing at all times. Prisoners remain in handcuffs and leg irons throughout the flight. Here's your lunch and water. You got your seatbelt buckle? Yes, I do. Okay. 
Inmates get a bagged lunch from the Bureau of Prisons, but eating it like this isn't easy. Even taking a drink is almost impossible. Absolutely everything is done in full restraints. At certain times, the convicts are able to use the, uh, the lavatories uh, aboard the aircraft. It's uh, under a very controlled environment where uh, it's one at a time, basically. We do not take the restraints off when they go to the bathroom. And there's no privacy because the door stays open. On these planes, the pilots work for the U.S. Marshal Service. Most have prior military or commercial airline experience. As ironic as it seems, they never worry about locking the cockpit door. We do not secure our doors because we know that all the hijackers and potential hijackers are sitting in row 17B. We know already where the hijackers and the terrorists are. We know where they're sitting. As a woman, I felt especially uncomfortable with a plane full of male inmates. But Officer Cheryl Stevens faces this every day. I mean, you've got guys on this plane who have been in prison, haven't been around women, and they've got you walking up and down the aisle. You must take a lot. Yes, I do. I ignore a lot, but I take a lot. I figure it's just part of the game. It is. There's a lot of head games, and you just have to ignore it. You just go on down. Because you have to command their respect. Right, right. After an hour, we landed in Oklahoma City. The Bureau of Prisons has a federal detention center adjacent to the airport. A jetway leads inmates directly into the maximum security facility. I was relieved to be back on the ground, but I was still a little anxious as the inmates filed past. Twelve years ago, they framed me, Joan. They framed me. Soon, these prisoners would once again be back behind bars. My flight had come to an end, but tomorrow, the marshals will transport yet another group of inmates to another city. It is a scary thing. I'm not going to tell you it's not a scary thing, and I, would, I can't imagine it not being scary for the marshals that are on the plane, for the pilots that fly the plane, but this is the most secure and certainly the most cost-effective way to move all these prisoners around the country, which they have to do. Con Air purposely keeps a low profile, so most travelers will never notice an unmarked j -Pass jet on an airport runway. But five days a week, 52 weeks a year, U.S. Marshals will continue to transport plane loads of inmates safely and securely across the country. What carries the day is being able to, to finish the day and still be in, in one piece, so to speak, and be able to go home to our families. Con Air, behind closed doors.